Our scripture this morning is the, comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel, one of the latter parables in the gospel, and it's called the parable of the ten bridesmaids, or sometimes the parable of the wise and foolish bridesmaids. I'll just go with ten and avoid the judgment. As we come to this passage, let us first join together in prayer. Gracious God, because you are God, it is your word and your word alone that is life for us. And because you are gracious, we trust that you will speak to us even now. We are here, O God. We are listening. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let us listen for God's word for us. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them began, became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all of those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No. There will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. I didn't think through the emotional risk of reading a parable about a wedding gone wrong just a few weeks before my own daughter gets married. We have been looking forward to her wedding for over a year now, and it's just weeks away. Last year, just after Sarah and Ryan were engaged, they came to visit us. It was a wonderful visit. They live in Dallas. They came to visit us. During that time, she said, hey, Dad, listen to this band. She pulled out her laptop and pulled up a uh, music a band was playing. I said, oh, they sound good, Sarah. She said, oh, good. I'm glad you think so, Dad. We want to hire them for our reception. You know, a band so much more engaging than a DJ. I said, I completely agree. She said, oh, good. She said, Ed, we're trying to decide if we should get the horn section. That's a little more costly to add the horn section. I said, well, the horns sound excellent. She said, oh, good. I'm glad you think so. I said, Sarah, here's what your mom and I are going to do. We're going to give you X amount of money for your wedding. You spend it any way you want. It's your money. You, spend, you don't have to check in with us at all. We're going to give you X amount. You spend it how you want. If there's any left over, you can keep it. The next morning, I said, what would you decide about the horn section, sweetheart? She said, oh, Dad, we're getting a DJ. She's been busy planning the perfect wedding, and I haven't had the heart to tell her that those don't really exist. I've been to a lot of weddings. One of the things I know is that they don't always go perfectly. I've been to weddings. I've been to a wedding once where the the grooms, when one of the grooms would anyway, left his forgot to pick his shoes up at the rental shop. So. Half the guys walked down in those shoes that looked like motor oil, and the others just walked down barefooted. I've been to a wedding where the father of the bride stepped on the veil. You know, it was on, it was on the floor, and when he turned around, he stepped on the veil and pulled it right off of her head. Then she said something she wished everybody hadn't heard. 
I've also been to a wedding where the father of the bride escorted the bride down to the center aisle. Didn't happen in this church. Escorted the bride down to the center aisle, and at that moment, his trousers dropped to the floor. Accidentally, of course, he's standing there in powder blue boxer shorts. One of my mentors did a wedding where he got to the vows, and he said, Now repeat after me. I, Michael, take you, Nancy. The, br- the groom said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm Michael, I'm... Can I say her real name? (laughs) The bride's name was Sally. Uh, Not everything goes perfect at a wedding, and my daughter's busy planning the perfect wedding, so I haven't shared these experiences with with her, but the thing I know is that as long as Ryan is there and as long as she is there, it'll be perfect even if other things go wrong. But I personally have purchased a new belt. What went wrong with this wedding in the story of Jesus is the groom was late. I've been to that wedding too. It's not a wedding you want to go to. The groom was late, very late. What happened in those days is the groom would go to another village most often to secure his bride, probably in an arranged marriage, and the bridesmaids were from the groom's home village. It's a little bit different than we do it today. The bridesmaids were from the groom's home village, some of his own family, no doubt, and they would wait at the edge of town until the groom returned with his bride, until love comes back to the village, and then the bridesmaid would dance as part of a processional back to the groom's house where they would then have a party like no other party. So the groom, bridesmaids are doing their job. They're at the edge of the village, but the groom's not coming. He's not showing. He's late, really late late enough that it becomes obvious that some of the bridesmaids have decided he's not ever coming. He's just gone. He's not ever coming. Love is never returning. I say they had stopped believing that the bridegroom would return because some of them didn't carry oil. They didn't carry oil for their lamps. When he was returned, they would light their lamps and lead the processional, but they didn't carry oil. Now, through the generations of the church, interpreters have tried to decide exactly what does this oil symbolize? What's it a metaphor? Some say it's a metaphor for, for faith or love or some such quality. I think it's hope, at least in this, in this sense. The only reason you would carry oil is if you expected to light the lamp. The only reason you take oil is if you thought someday the bridegroom's coming back. If you don't think that's going to happen, you don't need any oil. You see, what it was is there were some who continued to hope that he would return, and some had given up. And what you hope for or don't hope for shapes who you are today. Am I making any sense? Of course, like all of Jesus' stories, I noticed none of you said yes right then. I just want to know. I noticed none of you said yes. All of the stories of Jesus, this one is about a wedding, but it's not really about a wedding. It's about the promised day of God. And if anything is delayed... If anything is running late, it's the promised day of God. We can't avoid the promises of our faith. Our faith promises that someday justice will roll down like waters because someday we're just going to decide that fairness for everyone is something we can no longer live without. Our faith asserts that swords will be beaten into plowshares because someday it's just going to make more sense to us to feed one another than to fight one another. Our faith asserts that the poor will know good things because someday we will claim that while we don't all have to have the same, for the blessing of life to fall on a very few we'll finally see as sinful as it is. 
And the day will come when every burden and every dashed dream and every broken heart and every human injury will be mended and made whole and redeemed. But we don't know that day. It's even hard to see it from where we are. And even with the effort of people of goodwill through the generations to drag us toward that day, to lead us toward that day, to dream with us about that day, even with the effort of people of goodwill through the generation, that day remains a long and distant dream. And it's been long enough in coming that Jesus knew we might be tempted to doubt it can be trusted. We might be t begin to doubt that it'll ever come. The heart of the assertion that there is a promised day is this. Does God intend an ultimate purpose for us or not? Are our lives living towards some ultimate redemption, or is life just an accident and we're on our own? That, that is what is at stake in this assertion, and that is what is being addressed in this parable, and it's clear Jesus is encouraging us, carry the oil, don't lose hope, don't ever lose hope. He says, I know to have hope requires patience. Patience is not something you feel, it's something you choose. It's something you choose, usually what you're feeling is impatient. He says, don't lose hope, carry the oil. Like many of you, I've been reliving this week some of my visits with Dr. Bob. I I'm mindful that a majority of this congregation never knew him as their pastor, but those who did knew him as a pastor like none other. <laughs> I called him a couple of years ago. I called him a couple of years ago and I said, Dr. Bob, happy anniversary. And he was silent. He said, I'm sorry, Tom, today's not my anniversary. I said, of course it is. He said, no, 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 it's not. I said, Dr. Bob, you retired as the pastor of Village Church 25 years ago today. He said, what makes you think I would want to remember that? I'm getting old, he said. I said, Dr. Bob, you've aged, but you never get old. We never talked when he didn't want to know how you are. Dr. Bob was one who carried the oil of hope every day. He did it when he walked these, the streets of these neighborhoods to build this church from nothing to the largest church in the Northern Presbyterian system. He did it when he walked the streets of these neighborhoods to finally get rid of those housing restrictions that were tied to race. He carried the oil of hope when he spoke out for the inclusion of the LGBTQ community he carried the oil of hope when he spoke grace to those who had known personal heartbreak or shame in their lives. But to borrow from this text, he, he knew what these bridesmaids felt like. He sometimes felt that the love that was coming was delayed. We were talking this past year and he was grieving the continued battle with racism that is before us. And he said, it's disappointing the church is facing some of the same things that the church faced so many years ago. It seems like we would be further along, he said. I, I hoped we would be further along. You know, in some ways, we've come really far. In some ways, there is a kindness and a justice and a wisdom that was only imagined a generation ago. 
But in other ways, we are battling the same things over and over and over again. And for some, that might mean it's hard to maintain hope. For some, that might mean that it's easy to, to give up and just say that promised love is never coming. But I think that's the reason, I think that's the reason that we carry the oil of hope every day. We do the good that is ours to do every day because it matters. It requires patience. But when we trust that love is coming, that love that defines the world, that that love is coming, it gives us courage to do the good that is ours to do today. And no matter how small it might seem, it matters. In the 1980s, I read about a kid named Ryan White. You may remember him. He lived in Kokomo, Indiana, and was a hemophiliac. He, in a blood transfusion, contracted AIDS. He became national news because the school system said he was not allowed to come to class. An early high school kid ostracized from school. What I didn't know was a moment in the latter years of his life, he died as a young man. In a moment in the latter years of his life, he went to his church in Kokomo, Indiana on Easter Sunday, and he said the tradition in that church is the pastor would step down out of the pulpit and move to the front pews and shake a few hands of people in the front pews, because on Easter you actually have people in the front pews, and so shake a few hands of people in the front pews and say, the peace of the risen Christ be with you, and then the whole room would fall apart and everybody would give Easter greetings to one another, the peace of the risen Christ be with you. Ryan said in that moment, he held his hand out to the the family in the pew in front of him, and it, they just left it in the empty air. He says, hands were going every which way, and greetings were going every which way, but none to him nor to his family. No one could offer him peace on Easter. He said his family filed out of worship in silence, and then it got worse. Their car died just outside of the church parking lot. And they stood by the car as family after family, dressed in Easter clothes, drove by and no one would stop. Finally, a stranger pulled up and asked if they needed a ride, and they said they did, but they should tell him who they were. They said, this is Ryan White, and we are his family. And the stranger said, okay, can I give you a ride? In moments of carrying oil, the moments of carrying oil happen just like that. You can't anticipate them. You just know that each moment can be shaped by your faith. Every moment can be shaped by your confidence that God will be God, that God will do what God has promised to do, and it's, it's our privilege to live toward that better day. My friend and preacher, Michael Linval, he, he said of that moment in the Kokomo church, he said, one thing mattered that Easter morning. The sermon didn't much matter. How beautiful the choir was didn't matter that much. God was not counting the lilies. In the moral urgency of the moment, the one thing that mattered was that Ryan White was offered the peace of Christ. We live in an in-between time. It's, it's hard for us to imagine treating someone like that just because they have an illness. It's hard for us to imagine that now. That's progress. We are better, but we are not home. We are still living toward that day where every action is defined by love. And as Dr. Bob said to me this past year, you would think we'd be further along than we are. But we are where we are. And so the world needs you to carry the oil of hope. Don't lose hope. Don't ever lose hope. Carry the oil of hope, for that is the surest way to join the party 
that God has in mind. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.